Welcome to 1979-a-thon. What are we waiting for? This one picks up right after the first film ends. I guess if you want to be technical, Rocky II starts at about 95% of the way through Rocky I, which is a weird sentence to say, but it's true. Sylvester Stallone really wants to make this a seamless transition from the first one, and it does it pretty well. After Rocky's first fight with Apollo, he retires from boxing and focuses on becoming a husband, having a kid, and basically having a life outside of fighting. As far as sequels go, this is everything I could ever ask for. All the characters are back and are even better than they were in the first one. Apollo is a lot more relatable and feels like he's a human rather than just a plot device. That's not to say he wasn't good or acted well in the original, I'm just saying that it's done much better in this film. You really see Rocky's personality come out in this one even more, how he handles emotions like stress, anxiety, happiness, and hopelessness. This film really drives home the point that Adrian is Rocky's whole world. Nothing can move past Rocky if Adrian isn't right there with him. When Rocky Jr. is born, Adrian falls into a coma and we see Rocky basically freeze up. Nothing matters anymore, his whole world is put on the back burner. He doesn't speak, he doesn't leave the hospital room except to pray at the chapel, and he only does things if it helps him or Adrian. Like I said, Adrian is Rocky's whole world. It's really beautiful to watch, and you really believe that these are real people going through these things. I know I say that a lot, but it's really obvious when you watch this. I really love Rocky as a person. He's just an all-around nice and heartwarming guy to be around. He's never unkind to people and never gets upset when he feels like he's wronged. And he treats his wife with the most love and respect that she deserves. It's very refreshing to see such a kind soul just exist and at the same time have a calling in a sport that involves literally punching another person until they fall over. I will say while Sylvester Stallone and Burgess Meredith were really equal in being the best parts of the original Rocky film, Burgess Meredith definitely stands alone in this film. I mean, Mickey really goes from good to great in terms of his impact on the series as a whole. The best scenes in this film is when Rocky and Mickey both stay in Adrian's hospital room and wait for Adrian to wake up. Mickey realizes that the only way Rocky is going to be able to train and be ready for his fight with Apollo is if he knows Adrian is okay. Mickey decides to just be there for Rocky in every facet of his life, not just boxing. It really hits home when you see Mickey falling asleep inside Adrian's hospital room with Rocky in it. One weird thing I noticed that I couldn't get out of my head was Apollo is in amazing shape in this movie. I mean, almost 10 times better shape than Rocky. I mean, Jesus, in this film he even outweighs him by 20 pounds. Overall, this film met my expectations for a sequel to one of the best films of the 1970s. You could make the argument that Rocky 1 and 2 could be viewed as one continuous film, and it could definitely work as one. As for which film is better, personally, I think it goes to Rocky 2. Rocky yelling, Yo, Adrian! Adrian! and hugging Mickey in the final scene really pushes it over the edge for me. Again, you can make an argument for any of them. This film also has the best version of the Rocky theme that I've heard so far. This film has a reputation behind it, being its 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, which I know means so much in terms of telling whether or not a film is good. It really is the classic film asshole kind of movie. It's one of those films 20 year old pretentious asshats with little to no film knowledge and education will pretend to like so they can feel like they're better than other film buffs. I still have nightmares about the time someone said Pulp Fiction was a 7 out of 10 film, but I really love this movie. Oh my god was I hooked throughout this whole film. I'm not pretending or faking my enjoyment at all. This film had my attention for the entire run. That being said, I understand the argument that it's boring and that nothing happens. I don't agree, but if you're not looking for it or expecting it, odds are you're not going to find any substance. But there's plenty of it there, don't worry. Here's my argument though. This film is meant to envelop you into itself, like how the zone in this film envelops you and drives you almost crazy. While no big explosion or set piece goes off during the run of the film, you have evidence of it happening all around the characters. The mystery and the unknown is what draws you in. And in certain parts of the film, the anticipation makes you more on 
edge than anything else. Personally speaking, if something scary or otherworldly happened, it would have killed any wonder and mystery that the zone and the whole film had going for it. Speaking of the zone, it really is the fourth main character in the film, or the first one if you want to get all mystical about it. The cinematography by Leonid Kalashnikov, I mean Georgi Werberg, I mean Alexander Nedzinski, really does make the zone really feel like another world. All the sets from the decommissioned tank to the rivers and the fish that flow through the landscape, and just the shots of the snow and the pollution are stunning to look at. I never thought I'd hear myself say pollution is beautiful, but honestly it looks insanely crisp and clean. My genuine reaction after the scene where they go into the zone after being in the pole car was, holy shit, this looks amazing. I honestly thought that the yellow and black filter was going to be the entire film, but once they made it into the zone itself, the color shifts to a very vibrant color palette. It's a great visual metaphor, particularly for the stalker character himself. He only feels at home inside the zone, and his home life feels stale and boring. There are several scenes that go on for minutes at a time. I'm not talking about the usual tracking long takes that you'll find in other films. Some shots, like the one where the camera moves up the river with the mirror in the water, go on for about three minutes, and the shot where the characters make it to the zone itself. It goes on for almost four and a half minutes. It's films like this that remind you what can be done with filmmaking itself. Stuff that's truly different than what a painting or a book or a video game can accomplish. That's not to say that other art forms are inferior. It's just one of those times for me where I can look at something and wholeheartedly say, yeah, I understand this. That's not to say I understand absolutely everything this film was saying. To be honest, I'm still not entirely sure how the zone itself is significant to the characters themselves or entirely why the zone is as dangerous as the stalker himself says it is but that's what's going to keep me coming back. I'll figure it out in due time. It's a film that reminded me why I like to watch movies. Sometimes you get in a place after watching a bunch of films and think, why do I like this hobby again? And it's nice to pop in something like this and say, Oh yeah, that's why. So yeah, I'm a fan of this film, and I will definitely watch more of Tarkovsky's stuff in the future. This film won Best Picture for this year, and basically won all the major awards at the Oscars, with Meryl Streep winning the Best Actress and Dustin Hoffman winning Best Actor, and Jane Alexander was nominated for the same award as Meryl Streep. This film also won the award for Best Adapted Screenplay. So this film has been praised and praised by everyone, and it has been for over 40 years now, and I can definitely see why. But I gotta be honest, I had a rough time with the opening half hour, and that's not the film's fault at all, it's kind of my fault. When I was in school, the teacher would yell, alright kids, we're gonna watch movie and it was always the same dumb comedy with a high intensity little boy with big hopes and dreams and he always had a dopey dad who would screw up his whole style. I remember always being bored to tears sitting in class, wishing we were watching Bill Nye or something instead. Watching this film brought back those memories and I'll be honest, I wasn't having a great time. But now that I know this and I know what to expect from this film, it won't be an issue anymore. This may not seem that fair to compare these things in my head, but the way I see it, truly great films should be enjoyable regardless. And after about the 30 minute mark, it was way better better than those dopey comedies from the 90s and early 2000s. And the first thing I realized that it wasn't a comedy at all. This film doesn't beat around the bush either. It immediately starts off with Meryl Streep's character Joanne just leaving her family behind. And we're immediately thrown into the scenario of how the hell is this going to affect Ted Kramer and more importantly his son. You can really see the relationship build between Ted and his son as the movie goes along. They both deal with the loss of Joanne in pretty much the same way. And it's entertaining to see the differences and similarities that a 30 year old man and a 7 year old boy have in dealing with such massive change in their lives. I say that like she's dead, but no, she was just a total bitch and left. Joanne then comes back and meets with Ted to talk about taking custody back of their son. They go to court and they settle it with lawyers and judges. And watching these lawyers go for the throat on this newly divorced couple is so depressing to watch. They interrupt them and they demand every single painful memory out of them just to make their case. The way that Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep sell their grief and pain really does show their acting skills. And I can definitely see why they are considered legends today. Day. Though, the one big issue I have with this movie is Meryl Streep's character. Not that she acted bad or is bad in any way, she is fantastic. But they don't really give a lot of backstory on why she left Ted Kramer in the first place. She just kind of says that Ted wasn't giving her enough attention and wasn't listening to her husband enough. Ted does figure that out later on, but I would have really liked to see Joanne Kramer's side of the story a little more. Because showing it this way, she just comes across as being a massive bitch about the whole thing, and I find it really hard to sympathize with her. With Ted, yeah, he's a self-righteous dick 
dickhead at the start, but he grows into a more sympathetic person. We see him grow into a great single father. We see it, and we understand his pain and his reactions towards the end when he feels like he's been slighted by Joanne or his lawyer. Other than that though, this was truly an emotional film, and I cared about the characters in it. Jane Alexander as well should be mentioned, and honestly, she would be my pick as the best actress for this film. But you know, Meryl Streep and all that. So those were the films. I know I missed some great films this year, like Alien and all that jazz, but I want to lean into more obscure films in these videos. Not that Rocky is obscure, but you get the idea. If you want a video on Alien, I'm sure some other YouTubers have made much better videos than I could ever make on it. Anyway, thank you. Bye-bye.